Welcome back. It's the Big Blue Banter, New York Giants football podcast. I'm Dan Schneier, joined as always my co-host Nick Bellato. Today we're lucky. We got a special guest on the show, someone we didn't know if we could pull because he works his ass off during the weeks, <laughs> grinding film. No, it's funny, but you like we talked about this before the show, Eric. It's like, look, we and I know this for a fact because I talk with Nick about this and I feel bad about this. I get asked to be on a lot of shows during the yeah. season. And my general thing is I say no to them all because if I start to say yes to some. I feel bad about the mm -hmm. ones that I say no to. So, and I only do that because I don't have time. It's not right. because I don't want to do the shows. They're fun. So when you said you do it, I was like, damn, awesome. Like, it's such a nice thing of you to do because I know the grind and I know where you're at. But as we discussed beforehand, you made a special, you know, you made a special um, exception because this is Giants Bills. This is, yeah. there's so much to this matchup. And given where, you know, the Giants went, who they got from Joe Shane, Brian Dable. So we're excited to have you on. For those who don't know, Eric has works with Cover One. He breaks down tapes. This is going to be an X and O's based preview. It's not yes. going to be like some of the other ones we've had, which is exciting. I know for everyone, they always say, let's get more of these. We want more of these. Well, <laughs> help us find people and we'll do more of these. Today, we found someone great. Thanks to Nick. Um, so before we get into any of that, Eric, I want you to tell everyone where they can find your work. Yeah, so I, I'm the owner of uh, Cover One, CoverOne.Football. We have 14 podcasts on our YouTube network. Um, you know, my podcast, as you said, and, and is more centered on the X's and O's, the film, the scheme, um, the, the whys behind, uh, you know, everything that happens on the field. And so we try to, at Cover One, we try to take, you know, this complex game and, and make it simple uh, for the average fan, for the average Joe, and change that, you know, viewing experience for the average fan that's sitting there watching. And uh, so they're not, they don't have to ride the wave, you know, ride the wave as, as a normal fan and, and can get a better understanding of the game. So that's kind of, you know, our MO and philosophy at cover one. And, and, you know, I will just say, you know, I'm a huge fan of your guys' work. I, I said before we went live that we're cut from the same cloth. You know, we love the film. We're film junkies, but we also include the analytics. Nick, you know, you and I haven't gone through the scouting Academy and cross paths and networking in that way. You know, we, again, we're cut from the same cloth and I feel that like we approach this game in the proper manner objective we use all the data we can all the film we can to come to our conclusions and uh i'm just you know mad respect to you guys and what you guys do and thank you for having me on blessed to have you eric and i know we go back too. i used to yeah. be on a podcast network i don't know if that was like a side venture that you it had was grandstand then. sports yeah that oh, was yeah. pretty much what we're doing with cover one I, we i think we had 17 podcasts then so yeah it was different um different teams and I mean, we had all different types of sports there, but yeah, cover one now is, is primarily, you know, the bills and NFL draft. <laughs> and we'll get right into those Buffalo bills. So the Buffalo bills rank third in the league in pressure percentage with a pressure rate of 26.4%. They rank dead last in blitz rate. At just, <laughs> this is just depressing to read at 12.9% while leading the league in sacks with 21 and they're tied for a league lead in interceptions with eight. Yeah. Eric. Can you describe to the audience why Sean McDermott's zone coverage is married so well to their pass rush and how that allows Buffalo to get home with four so frequently? You know, and this year is a little different, too, compared to prior years, because now McDermott is the coach on the defensive side of the ball. He is calling the plays and designing this defense as Leslie, Leslie Frazier kind of moved on. So with Fra with uh, McDermott, it starts with coverage and it starts with disguising coverage on the back end. And, you know, they're a zone-based team, but they're more of that vision-based zone team where some teams are running zone, but then they're kind of matching up. It becomes man, right, at a certain point. With the Bills, it's vision-based. They give that leeway to their DBs to jump routes based on the quarterback, you know, eyes and how he's trying to manip manipulate the defense. And so this year, that vision-based system is so much, aside from, I'd say, last game when you look at the Jags game and the blitzing, the – the harmony between the pass rush and the coverage and disguising the coverage and getting that quarterback to hold it half a click longer so that the pass rush can get home. I think that's where this year we're seeing it. It's a little different and the bills are throwing some new wrinkles on the back end, getting quarterbacks to hold on to the ball. And then the defensive line, they're coming in waves the, the bills, you know, at times, aside from some of the injuries that have crept up, they're rolling guys, you know, six, seven, eight guys at a time. And they're coming in waves. So I think the harmony between pass rush and, and the coverage this year has been really good early on. Um, and, and I think that's why they're not having the blitz a lot more, aside from, you know, last game against Trevor Lawrence. And the, the front four, or the, the four they send, I should say, eventually get home and create that pressure. I know we're probably going to get into this a little bit later. I have it in the run fit section portion of this. Yeah. 
But how much will the loss of Daquan Jones and Matt Milano affect this defense? I saw some of the backups yeah. that you guys had, and I was pretty impressed. And we'll get into that a little bit later. But just in terms of pressure and coverage, how much of a loss are those two players? Uh, start with Daquan Jones. I mean, huge fan of him. I Before the Bills even signed him, I was like, the Bills need to go out and get this guy. He's a difference maker. He obviously came from Carolina as well, so there was that pipeline. But his pressure from the nose tackle position was just out of this world lately, and he's being double teamed at, at some of the highest rates. If you look at some of the advanced statistics, he's being double teamed. Obviously, sometimes that is because he's a nose tackle, and he's you know he's a, a tilted yeah. nose, and you're going to get some of that center guard exchange initially. But his quickness off the ball at his size, 315, it was creating issues up the middle. And then, again, he's got Ed Oliver next to him. So they had a really nice tandem going this year, and he was playing at an all-pro level. He was he started off this year at that level, being very disruptive up the middle, part of the reason why the Bills don't have to blitz a lot and, and they're able to create pressure. Matt Milano, he's, you can't replace him. You just can't. You can't replace him. He does too much. He's got too many reps in this defense. He understands how offenses are going to attack and attack him and attack the secondary second level of the Bills defense. And he's just a matchup linebacker. You want to play zone? He can read, you know, the eyes of the quarterback and make a play on the ball. You want to play man? He'll match up with anyone. You match up with, you know, Travis Kelsey or any of the tight ends in the league. You see him even carry wide receivers deep. So you can't replace those type of guys, specifically even Matt Milano. But I do like the depth, as you said, Nick. I like the depth of the D line. Guys that they're going to, you know, fill in and, again, run those waves of D-linemen. Um, and, and Dorian Williams kind of stepped in last week early, had some missed tackles early on, which you got to expect from a guy coming from Tulane, and that play speed's ratcheted up, thrown into the mix. Um, but the, eventually Dotson did come in. So I the depth there is questionable. We'll see how they can handle it. But Dotson, he's got a lot of reps in this defense too. He started games for the Bills at linebacker before. So it'll be interesting to see where they go on Sunday night between Williams and Dodson. Eric, in your first answer, breaking down Sean McDermott's defense, you mentioned something about how quarterback uh, corner, the defensive backs have their eyes on the quarterback, something that Daniel Jones has struggled with. He's had the propensity to throw the number two receiver for the Giants at trap coverage. We saw sure. this against Seattle. We've seen this throughout his career, really. Um, teams have been employing trap coverage to the field side because the Giants simply put don't throw a lot to the field side. They don't challenge it often. Mm -hmm. um, something Nick observed, which I thought was interesting, was the Bills ran Palms trap versus two a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, play where Berrios got blown up on a second and long. Is this something that the Bills will experiment with based on opponent or is it something you see within their game plan <clears throat> on a weekly basis? No, this is uh, at the core of their coverages. They're a quarters team, right? They're a okay. quarters team. So it's not an experiment. <laughs> It's a quarters team, and they're able to do this because, as, as I said, they're able to disguise on the back and make a lot of these coverages look the same until post-snap and that picture changes. And they have two guys on the back end in Jordan Poyer and Micah Hyde who are former corners. So when you want to run those trap coverages and that corner is reading that number two and that number two hits, hits you know, goes to the flats and he's going to trap it and he's going to drive on it, those safeties are already over the top covering the, the vertical route that is going behind that corner. So – they're very good on the back end of reading combinations, two-man combinations, three-man combinations when they do want to trap. And honestly, this is the new NFL. A lot of teams aren't playing your typical right. Tampa 2 coverages. They're matching and, and matching routes. So um, they're a quarters team. I think you know the guys on the back end allow them to kind of play these coverages. And, I mean, one of my first film room breakdowns with a player was with Jordan, po uh, Jordan Poyer years ago when he executed the Palms trap. Um, it was against the Bengals in 2018. So it's been there. It's at the core of this team. They have always been a too high, you know, split field type team. And it's because of those two safeties. With Palms, have you guys ran into a lot of teams that are running stack with releases, uh, with the, with the one receiver releasing behind the number one to kind of confuse what yes. the deep safety is going to do? Cause that's something we've seen Mike Kafka and Brian Dable employ against defenses that are similar to Sean McDermott's. Yeah. I think it's one of those trends that's happening right now because of the pattern matching that goes on. And the bills used to run it under Dable too with Cole Beasley. It was always an option yeah. route that a clear route and option route behind it. The bills still do it now. They'll, you know, sub in Hardy. They'll sub in digs. They're using their tight ends in that way. Kincaid. Um, I think that's how offenses are battling those pattern matching coverages because the whole spot dropping zone coverages is a thing of the past. You're not just getting to a landmark. You're playing the guy in your zone and matching the route combination. So 
absolutely. I think that's one of the number one ways to attack those pattern matching coverages. How in your mind, Eric, has Sean McDermott done a good job to scheme against an offense that's kind of like the Giants? Let's say Daniel Jones plays. We don't know yet. He hasn't practiced this week. He says he's going to play. Even if he doesn't, Tyrod Taylor, obviously similar in regards to mm-hmm. athleticism at the quarterback position. Does he have a specific game plan in your uh, from your experience following McDermott and even back to Leslie Frazier's days when mm-hmm. he coordinated, which is still McDermott's defense at large? to defend against these type of quarterbacks? Like, are we going to see spies? Like what, what can the giants expect in this game? Yeah, that's, that's what's interesting. Cause you know, prior to last season under Frazier, the mobile quarterbacks gave the bills defense issues. Cause again, they're attack oriented. They're up the field. They're worrying about, you know, rushing the passer, then stopping the run and route to the passer. So they're very up the field and that's their first priority is rushing the passer. And so there are times where, you know, whether they're looping or not on stunts or games, where they're going to lose contain a guy, a D tackle doesn't replace an end that kind of looped inside. And so then that's when those mobile quarterbacks can, you know, really hurt the bills defense. But last year, and this is mainly because of Patrick Mahomes the prior two years, the bills, uh, they started to execute what we call odd mirror and odd mirror front and something they got from the college level from Georgia, where basically it's three down linemen. They're rushing the quarterback. They're pinning their ears back, not worrying about contain. Then they would have Matt Milano, which again, he's not going to be there. He would be that aggressive spy. So as soon as that quarterback got off the spot and he wanted to flush out left or right, that aggressive spy in Milano would go attack him. And that would be that fourth rusher. It was like a delayed rush and and spy. So I don't know if they're going to employ that for this game. And if so, what guy would play that, that role, but that, that is typically over the last year and a half, they have tried to attack mobile quarterbacks and, you know, whether it's Taylor or it's Jones, um, they are both mobile, as you said. And and I do think that there are going to be some times where they're going to get out of the pocket and, and, you know, convert some first downs with their legs. You saw Trevor Lawrence do it last week. You can't completely stop it, but it's it's the timing of those plays. You don't want it on third and 10. You don't want it on third and 12. It's the timing of that. So, um, so far this year, the Bills have been pretty good in that department, but they haven't really faced too many athletic quarterbacks. I think the Bengals stole that odd mirror from the Bills. You guys ran that a little we bit ran it in, against the, them. in the divisional round. Yes. I know I've got to be a heartbreaker for you. Sorry, yeah. Eric. And then <laughs> no, in the AFC, right. the AFC championship, I saw a lot of that. Mm-hmm. I saw a lot of odd mirror from the Cincinnati Bengals to contain Patrick Mahomes and just harass him that entire game. That's what beat them in week six. That's what the Bills used. That was a brand new package they rolled out just for Patrick Mahomes. And it's actually what led to that game clinching interception by Taron Johnson at the end. See, see there, man. Oh, God, I love you. Watch football, film. Football it's, go, go figure. Right. I love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's awesome. So I have one, uh, one more question on the pass rush. Yeah. I know it was only 20 snaps, but how did Von Miller look last week in his return from last year's torn ACL? You know, he was on a pitch count and it was a hard pitch count. Like as soon and even, you know, you got into the third quarter and it's like they needed him because again, there was those injuries and they were playing guys that were just up from the practice squad. Um, he was on a hard pitch count and they stuck to it, but he was, he was limited. He was limited athletically. There wasn't much explosion. And I don't think he tested it too much because I'm sure, you know, he wanted to just get, you know, through the routine of warming up, getting into the game, getting the flow of things. Um, but you saw on a few of those rushes, you saw that pacing and change of pace that he uses and, and shimmy to, you know, not necessarily to beat the tackle, but if he was going at 100%, he would have a chance to create some pressure on that play. But I still think he's, you know, a few weeks to maybe a several weeks away to really getting to that top notch gear that we're used to with Von Miller. God, he has to be looking at. Oh, sorry, Dan, but he no, has to be looking at this matchup, being like, "Coach, just let me play." <laughs> I know. <laughs> that's what what I mean. Yeah, <laughs> like it's interesting in the sense that, like, if the Bills are smart, they treat this as, "Wow, we're fourteen and a half point favorites. Let's not rush him back." Right. But it's also like this could be the easy get right game for Von Miller. That like, yeah, gives him that confidence to kind of take it to the next but, level. And they, the- and they haven't needed him. That's the, the, like you guys yeah. name all those stats at the beginning. So it's like, just he's here to be a closer. You know, as a pass rusher and late in the season. And that's what they need to ramp up to. Uh, right. Regardless if it is a get right game, I am not rushing him back, even though I'm sure all the juices are going to be flowing Sunday night in prime time. 
Yeah, against Eric, these two offensive tackles. Yeah, oh, exactly. Geez. Eric, AJ Epinesa had a couple PBUs, a couple mm-hmm. nice plays last week. And I wanted to bring him up because his name is synonymous with our podcast from a, from a long standing joke here where Dan Schneier got called out by a primary member of Giants Media due to a disagreement about AJ Epinesa. So I just kind of uh-huh. wanted to pick your brain, Paulie Don, <laughs> shout out on AJ Epinesa. What's your opinion of that player? Listen, he's gone through a lot. You know, I was high on Epinesa, not first round high, but I was high on him as a rusher, especially when you're talking the traits that this team typically looked at as a power rusher and his size, his ability to kick inside. So I was high in that regard when we're talking, fitting in and, you know, projecting to the Bills scheme. Now, when he came to the Bills, they made him lose weight. That's the thing. They made him, you know, get smaller and work on an explosion. And ever since then, he's a completely different player where, He's not a power play anymore. He's not just a long arm guy. He's actually using his get off, his burst and explosion. And it's it's like week in and week out, you see a lot of these numbers when ESPN puts out, you know, the numbers about, you know, the get off and, and time off the snap. He's usually one of the, the quickest guys, which is still mind boggling to me. Yeah. And so in this season, in this contract type year, he's been playing really good under McDermott. And He's more of a, a specialist. He's not all that good against the run. He slips off a lot of tackles and misses a lot of tackles. But I got to give him credit because he's gone through a lot and a lot of people have written him off and he's still hanging in there. He's he's going to get he's going to get a good contract, you know, once it's his time comes. That's interesting because he's reviving his career and doing it in a different way. Yeah, totally I've, different way. And this is good for him to try to find that as a yeah. player. Um, and that's not something that I saw at all at Iowa either. So it's interesting, like yeah. just to see the transformation of the, of how he's able to win in the NFL. You would think if you're able to win with power at the college level, you wouldn't be able to win maybe with speed at the NFL level, but if you right. transform your body, you potentially can. Yeah. Um, I have another question about, uh, Nick has a few more, but I'm going to just want to get this one in about a player who you guys had on your roster and now he's on the giants roster and that's Boogie Basham similar in the sense to Epinesa that it was a slow start with the bills, but instead of kind of, you know, letting him develop with the bills, they, they made the decision to move on and trade him mm-hmm. to the giants. He hasn't played much for the giants. And I think that's a big surprise for some fans when you consider how many injuries the giants have had at that around that position and just the different bodies and the expect expectation for a rotation players who I don't think have been good. Like I think Jihad Ward has taken a big step back on tape this year for the giants. And that's some of the, that when I see him on the field, I almost wonder why isn't it boogie Basham, but maybe you can give some insight into why it didn't work out with Basham and maybe some of your takeaways from his film with the bills. So personally, when Basham was coming, coming out, I wasn't a big fan of his game. All right. I knew he had a lot of experience. He was pro ready. According to a lot of people, when again, when I was projecting him into the Bills defense, all I saw was a high motor player. I didn't see uh, a pass rush plan. I didn't see a lot of combinations as far as pass rush goes. I remember when he came out, and again, I do film breakdowns, usually videos, on every single draft pick. For him, I didn't know what to do for that content. And so what I did was I watched a couple of clinics from his old D-line coach, and I, I, I talked about how he stopped the run. Like, it, it just wasn't there for me personally evaluating him i didn't like to pick and also because they double dipped at dn that year they didn't have to do that they double dipped at dn and they double dipped at offensive tackle it was a weird draft and they were doing that because again mahomes had torched them and so they wanted some athleticism they wanted some different types of players some juice and he had a really good combine when it came to again that explosion him and rousseau explosion the get off but i personally didn't like him and so his he didn't really develop all that much with the bills i will say that he was a, a lot of his sacks were low quality sacks and pressures that were late in plays where he was just hustling, which again, that's not a, that's not a knock. That's a good thing, but that can't be where you hang your hat on when you're drafted where he was drafted. And so um, I think that's why they were moving on from him. And they saw again, right next to Epinesa, you see Epinesa putting in the work, putting in that grind and changing his entire game. And, and you saw him developing where you just weren't seeing it from, from Basham. We have not seen Boogie Basham play many snaps here. And as Dan said, it's not like the Giants have a stacked edge room. Yeah. Aziz Ojolari, who was their Good most shot. explosive yeah. pass rusher, he hasn't been playing. So it says something. I mean, he's new to the defense. So try to, you know, give him an excuse, if you will. But <laughs> I wanted to ask you watching the Bills play crack toss and outside runs versus watching the Giants play them was a night 
and day. Yeah. <laughs> which is very depressing. Milano yeah. was a big reason for that, but Terrell Bernard is a very good linebacker from what I've seen. And I was also impressed with somebody you brought up earlier, Terrell Dodson and yeah. the young Dorian Williams as well, to, to some degree, missing tackles. Like you said. Sure. With Milano out, how much of the run fitting continuity is going to suffer for this defense? As I said, Milano, you can't replace him. He's got a lot of reps. I mean, he's calling out plays prior to the snap, but I will say that Bernard has opened up pretty much the entire Bills Mafia fan base because, you know, a lot of people were, they were divisive about, uh, you know, Tremaine Edmonds and what he brought and all of his athleticism, all those traits, but they thought he lacked the instincts and the mental processing to play the mic position. And for a guy in, like Bernard, undersized a complete opposite end of the spectrum than Edmonds to come in and wear the green dot in his second year having played limited snaps last year to come in and show the maturity and he's out there again kind of calling out plays directing traffic and as I said it you know those zone defenses and zone coverages they're it's all about communication as you guys know and he is just on point he's the what we're calling him in the film room he's the air traffic controller you just see him prior to the snap pointing things out, getting people set, but also, hey, hey, you know, push, push, push. He's sending that running back out to the outside linebacker, and he's finding that tight end coming on the crossing route. So he's been mature beyond his years. And so, you know, his film study, it, it stands out on film against the run. And while he is undersized, he's got that dog mentality that he's going to do whatever it takes to beat the block. Sometimes it's undercutting the block, and he may get hooked, you know, and the ball gets outside. But more times than not, he's taken the proper angle to make a play. He's um, kind of freestyling with his body and, and contorting his body to undercut a block, to shed a block, to avoid a block, rather than the old school, sh you know, stack and shed mentality. So he's impressed me. I love linebackers. It's my favorite position to study. I study him every week, and he's impressed me, especially when you compare his physical traits to what we had in Tremaine Edmonds. What's going on, Big Blue Banter listeners? I'm excited for the football season for several reasons, and one of those reasons is Prize Picks, which is North America's largest independently owned daily fantasy sports platform, and it's so simple to use. Instead of battling thousands of other players, including professionals, sharks, and people who are going to exploit you, you pick more than or less than on two to six player stat projections, and you just watch the winnings roll in. It's very simple to play and gives you a little extra skin. I've set my picks in less than 60 seconds. There are so many stats to choose from, and the withdrawals of funds are easy and quick. Dan and I will be adding a segment to our show before every game where we pick our favorite stats, more or less yards or touchdowns, what have you, and we'll be discussing why from a scheme, matchup, and game theory perspective. I love their promotions and how easy their interface is to operate at prize picks. I may select more on tackles for a loss from Bobby Okereke or Kayvon Thibodeau next game. They also do other sports as well. It's a really cool experience. Please join Dan and I in the fun of prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash banter and use code banter for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, go to prizepicks.com slash banter and use code banter for a first deposit match up to $100. You will not regret it. Make Little Caesars, the official pizza sponsor of the NFL, Part of your game day. There are few things better in the world than kicking back, watching some football, and biting into some delicious Little Caesars pizza. Order online during our Pizza Pizza pregame, one hour before and three hours after NFL kickoffs, plus all day on Sunday. And get ready for some football and fun. Choose your favorite Little Caesars pizza or pick the toppings you crave. Old world pepperoni, pepperoni, extra cheese, Italian sausage, olives, onions, pineapple if you're into that. Put it on half the pie, the entire pie. There are so many other options that I don't have time to name. Slap that on a round crust, a thin crust, a stuffed crust, a Detroit style deep dish. Either way, you win. And speaking of winning, Everyone scores with convenient delivery or our in-store pizza portal pickup. So grab some friends and enjoy a few slices during the game. To exercise and recover at your best, you need quality sleep. And to achieve quality sleep, the right mattress matters. 
Mattress Firm will help you find the right mattress for restful and restorative sleep with their wide selection of high-quality mattresses from top brands at every price point. Quality sleep on the right mattress means improving your overall performance both in and out of gameplay. And with Mattress Firm's low price guarantee, you can rest easy. See a lower price? Mattress Firm will match it. Plus, try it for 120 nights to make sure it's right for you or your money back. To start feeling and performing at your best, find your mattress at the early holiday savings event at your local Mattress Firm store or online. We are brought to you today by Manscaped, who has taken a step up from Balloween to bring your face the cleanest shave it's ever seen. So this season, no need to toil in trouble. Manscaped's all-new handyman is the best way to get rid of that stubble. Featuring a compact design and next-gen skin-safe technology, the handyman was designed to give you that smooth finish without the mess of a traditional shave. Get the sweetest treat this Halloween by going to manscaped.com and use code BIGBLUE for 20% off plus free shipping. And for all my wolf men out there, yo, shout out. If you got a little bit more scruff on your face, Manscaped's Beard Hedger Pro Kit has everything you need to tame your mane. This cordless trimmer has a rotary wheel that gives you 20 hair cutting lengths all with one guard. So no more drawers full of extra add-ons collecting cobwebs and is very annoying. To organize. There's no trick with this treat. Manscaped has you covered. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code BIGBLUE at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use code BIGBLUE. For a look as sweet as candy, get yourself the handyman from Manscaped. So Buffalo struggled to contain Travis Etienne on outside runs. The running back, I think he had two nine-yard runs that were somewhat consecutive, and then he bounced a 31-yard run outside. A lot of those weren't just off of the run design. They were just bounced outside, and Etienne used his athletic ability. So what happened to the contained defenders on those plays, and was that an issue prior to the Jacksonville game? Because I know Buffalo ranks pretty high with rushing yards allowed. Yeah, and it starts with missed tackles. They're always up there in missed tackle percentage. They're like, I think they're second worst in the league at like 16% when it comes to missed tackles. And on those plays, I'm pretty sure two out of three of those, or maybe even all three, were a duo. And so duo, as you guys know, and maybe some of your listeners know, the whole purpose of duo is to get the running back down, down towards the line of scrimmage, and then eventually, more times than not, it bounces outside to get that one-on-one look against a corner. And on those plays... Kyir Elam slipped off tackles. You had um, Dodson, the, the big run at the end. It was uh, Dodson kind of overplaying his gap. He's he's playing the, uh, I think there's a C gap there. The tight end's coming from his right. He takes him on instead of just getting into his gap. And he eventually gets, uh, kind of gets held on the play a little bit. It's, it's very subtle though. Um, and, and they're able to bounce it. So it, I think mainly on those plays, it's been missed tackles and, primarily from the corners, which is why Kyer Elam late in the game after um, uh, right before that run, he was replaced and, and and they put Ingram in who's a practice squad call up because they were worried in that four minute drill at the end when they needed to stop uh, Trevor Lawrence and the Jags offense from running the game out. They, they wanted to make sure they had a tackler in there and it still didn't work. So they pulled, you know, their starting corner for that game out just to make that tackle and, and they still couldn't stop it. So it's always missed tackles with the bills when it comes to run defense. Um, very rarely is it a, um, you know, a gap integrity issue. Um, but it's also why you like, yes, they miss a lot of tackles, but they're also a nickel, you know, <laughs> a lot in the 90 percent uh, percentile range. And they're also always tops in the league when it comes to havoc rate where, you know, those tackle for losses, sacks, intercept interceptions, uh, fumbles, force, all of those like toxicity plays like they're always top one uh, or one or two over the last five years. So. It's kind of that trade-off. And this year, there's a lot of that risk-reward going on, which is why they are getting a lot more turnovers this year. I wanted to ask you one more question, just something that was pretty obvious on the Jacksonville tape. In your estimation, what did Jacksonville do to matriculate the football relatively easily off of play action? Jags had five plays of 10-plus yards through play action on first down alone. Yeah. I mean, first of all, kudos to them. They have a really good quarterback. And honestly, they have some really good skill players with speed. Um, so I'll give him credit there. I'd say the misdirection 
Um, a lot of the, the the play action stuff from under center had some really nice, you know, ball handling skills, hiding the ball. They kept the Bills on an edge with some of those jet sweeps and having to worry about that coming across the formation, whether he got the ball or not. Um, but yeah, those that the speed and those crossers and on those three level passing concepts, I thought got the ball in the perimeter on a lot of those half field reads, got Lawrence on the edge of the defense with, uh, again, that run pass option. And I think that, you know, the overall that speed um, really helped it. And then again, kudos to Ridley. That boy is, he's good. Yeah. He's one of the up and coming wide receivers, if not already at that tier, he's nasty. And so I, I'm going to give credit to, you know, where credit is due, but that speed and the skill on that offense is really good. And, and I think you're going to see that even more as the year goes on. Flipping it over to the other side of the ball here, Eric, I want to ask you a little bit about Brian Dable during his time with the bills. So I know there were some issues with bill fans over two things. One, Brian Dable's play calling at times. And then two, sometimes that's something I've seen lately, the way he handled Josh Allen in game on the sideline at times, we've seen giants fans question both the play calling this year and, how Brian Dable's handled Daniel Jones on the sideline when he makes a bad play. How did you feel about this when Dable was coaching the Bills? And do you see any con cause for concern in either area? No, I mean, even as recent as yesterday, Josh Allen said, you know, if there's one person he would give most of the credit to for his him blowing up and glowing up, it's Brian Dable. And so um, I would say, you know, the fans had their issues with Brian Dable in many ways that they have their issues right now with Ken Dorsey. <laughs> and it's very, it's nitpicky. It's like, okay, why are you running the ball on second and long? It's like, well, because there's, it's a too high shell and that's, that's playing the numbers game. Like that's smart to do. Um, and so the little things like that, you know, have crept up regardless if it's Dable or Dorsey. I think that's just fans being fans in many ways. I know Dable personally, I, you know, have contact with him you know, pretty frequently. And when he does things like that on the sideline, it's for a reason. And he understands, he understood Josh Allen better than Dorsey does right now. He understood how to reel Josh Allen in or get him in rhythm early in the game. He understood how to calm him down, whether that's talking to him or, Hey, this is the next play I need to call to reel him in a little bit. He understood Josh Allen very well. I mean, Josh Allen, when it came to them drafting Josh Allen, he, Dayball did a bunch of studies on all the quarterbacks and he, as soon as the bills took Josh Allen, he understood exactly how Josh Allen learned things. So you, I don't know if you guys saw that story a few years back where, you know, when they, they, they picked up Josh Allen, Josh is a visual learner. He, he so they changed their entire practice plan when it came to install during the week, early in the week. And, and they would make it a walkthrough where they go into the weight room and the weight, where the weight room has like a balcony. And so everyone would go on the offense, would go into that install session and Josh would walk through all of the protections, all of the plays they are going to call the game script and all that, rather than sitting in a meeting room for an hour and a half and looking at a piece of paper or whiteboard. So Dable's in tune to a lot of these things. He's got a lot of experience with a lot of different quarterbacks. And I personally still believe he's a better play caller, play designer, manager of quarterbacks than Dorsey is right now, but Dorsey is early on. He doesn't have the reps and game experience that Dable does, especially big games in, in um, over the years. So um, I think if, if Dable's doing something like that and, and calling out Daniel Jones on a sideline or any other player, it's for a reason. And he believes that that is the type of coaching that player can withstand and that it, he needs it from time to time. Eric, other than all of the excellent points you just made, what, in your opinion, made Brian Dable such a good play caller in Buffalo? And why did he get so much out of Josh Allen? Because if we remember, a lot of people did not think Josh Allen would work out. Now he's an absolute superstar. Yeah, it's uh it's it's the juice he's got, right? Um, I would say what you know what made him so good as a play designer is again, he understood like, okay, this is what we need to need to do to beat said coverage, but this is what my comfort my quarterback is comfortable with. And so he he, he brought those two together. He meshed those things really well for Josh Allen. And early on, it was this offense under Josh Allen was kind of like your offense last year, RPO-based. It was RPO-based. And, and that was a good thing at that time and that trend because, again, you're seeing a lot of zone coverage. You're seeing – because they want to keep eyes on the mobile quarterback. You're seeing a lot of those two high shells, kind of the trends of the league. Um, and then it just – it it you know, he tweaked it a little bit where they're running a lot of – Stuff they he ran at Wyoming, those you know three level passing concepts, a lot of smash concepts, um, and I just think he understood Josh Allen, uh, the player and person. Whereas Ken Dorsey, 
he's run one of the most efficient offenses the last few years and and Bills fans still don't like him but it's a different it's a different type of offense he's very good having played quarterback he's very good at understanding what concepts beat said coverage but he's been kind of lacking and I will say he's he's improved in this area this year he's been kind of lacking on like okay how do I get Josh in rhythm early with those concepts and you know dialing up things that make Josh comfortable because he's a very emotional guy as you guys know a very emotional guy and so he's a guy that sometimes can get wrapped up in the emotions of a game or moment and we just haven't seen Dorsey reel it in like we saw Dable do that's a great point and We'll see where the Bills fans are at with Dorsey, I think, as it goes through. Like, I feel like at this point, Bills fans, and it's funny, we talked about this a little bit too before the pod, Eric. The expectations change so much. Like, right now, I feel like with Bills fans, if you don't make it to the Super Bowl at the very least, it's considered a failure Mm -hmm. at this point. Um, And fair or not, I I kind of get it when you have Josh Allen as your quarterback. But I want to ask you about a player who the Bills drafted this year, Dalton Kincaid. This is a player who the Giants uh, said after the draft, they had discussions with the Bills about potentially trading uh, within the draft to to kind of, you know, if if it had worked out in that way. But when the Bills drafted Kincaid, Eric, I personally envisioned a much different role for him right away based on the film study of how he won at Utah. And I was a huge fan of his tape there. And I thought he'd be kind of the missing piece to unlock the offense in the intermediate area of the fields, which I thought would then open up different things for Diggs and Davis. Yeah. But I really haven't seen that much yet uh, from Dalton Kincaid, or at least being, I haven't seen him being used in the way I guess I expected him to be used. Why do you attribute his slow start from like a target share standpoint and from the, from this type of route participation he's had? Well, first of all, I mean, you know, after this regime has been here for a few years, so, you know, they have depth and they have players at those positions. You know, Dawson Knox is a starter that the bills have developed and invested in. And so, you know, initially, um, you know, he's got to play behind him. He's got to pay his dues in that regard. Um, and you know, at Utah, he was used a lot differently. Yes. It was more vertical intermediate area, but he also came from a, a three tight end offense that was running a lot of under center stuff and a lot of play action. And he was kind of that stretch, you know, player in a lot of those ways and in the red zone. So I think he's paying his dues right now. And I do think he's going to blow up the bills have 100%. And I showed a bunch of these clips on my, on my timeline. They have 100%, you know, drawn up plays and called plays where he's the first or second read and, you know, the ball goes elsewhere. Um, And it's not just in the short zero to nine yard range down the field. A lot of their smash concepts go back to the Jets game. He ran 10 corner routes and smash concepts. And he was that high, the high route, the vertical route, whereas the ball was going under uh, into the five to 10 yard range and he wasn't getting the ball. Uh, So. They're not using him. They're not targeting him vertically as much as, you know, many people. And I know this is a a big talking point right now, but he is being schemed in that area. And, you know, that intermediate and deeper area The ball's just not going there. And the context behind how they're using him early is the biggest worry going into the uh, this season was the Bills offensive line, specifically right tackle Spencer Brown. Coming off a back injury last year, he was kind of the weak link going into this season. So early on. When you're playing teams like the Commanders, when you're playing teams that you know Max Crosby and, and, and the Raiders, the Bills obviously were keeping in their tight ends a lot to block and chip and then release and be the outlet and be in that you know zero to five yard range as Josh works high to low. So I think the context behind that and how you know the schedule is kind of you know, unfolded for them uh, and helping uh, Spencer Brown and some of these tackles versus some you know, really good pass rushers. I think that played a huge part in it too, but like, I think this week, again, if he can get through concussion protocol and we'll get to it, I think this is the week where he could potentially have that breakout game, but he's got to make it through uh protocol because right now he, he's got two limited practices in a row was wearing the red Jersey today, him and Knox are kind of banged up. So it'll be interesting to see if he does play this week. And if he does, I think he could have that breakout game that you're talking about. So I have a question specifically about Josh Allen and the blitz. Josh Allen has been blitzed on 30.1% of snaps on the season, but the Jaguars blitz Josh Allen on 46.5% of snaps, 16.4% increase through the first five weeks. Allen had a completion percentage of 73.1% against the blitz with a yards per attempt of 8.1, just astounding. But in week five against Jacksonville, he was nine of 18, 50% against the blitz with only a 3.7 yards per attempt. Allen was 22nd in EPA versus the blitz in week five. Was it the fish and chips 
Or what did Jacksonville do differently to warrant such a drastic disparity in success versus the Blitz? Uh, it started with making the Bills one-dimensional. The Bills couldn't run the ball, and they honestly just got away from it because early on they had two three-and-outs. They had five drives of four plays or, or less, and so they made them one-dimensional. They couldn't get the run game going. That put them, as you guys know, getting behind the chains, behind script. You're getting the third and long. You're getting this third and seven, third and 10, third and 12, and that's not where you can live consistently in the NFL. And so once the Bills got into those situations, the Jags did a really good job. And and I will say the Jags are like the bugaboo for the Bills because they it's like they know the pass protections of the Bills. And we saw it in this game on those third and longs, they dialed up some really good blitzes that got an unblocked defender. They they figured out, "Hey, hey, if I we're mugging these A gaps, we're going to, you know, the center's going to slide to the right here. We're going to get it the tackle in a bind. He's going to have to squeeze inside squeeze that interior gap and you're going to get a free edge rusher off the edge, Josh Allen, the edge rusher. And and that happened time and time again. It's almost like they knew the protections and had a, a really good beat on it. And that's what scares me about the giants because Dable knows this offense, like the back yeah. of his hand. He knows those protections. He can, he's easily letting wink know, Hey, on this play, you know, they're going to protect, you know, in three by one set, they're going to protect this way. And he's going to have to throw it hot to the running back. And if he doesn't, you're going to have Josh Allen you know, a chance to bring him down or disrupt him. And I think the Jags did a really good job of that. It, even if they did, weren't getting sacks, they understood, hey, he's going to throw it hot to the tight end, to the running back, go make the tackle. And they did short of the sticks time and time again. So I just think that the Jags did a really good job when it came to third downs. And it was all because, again, the Bills were one-dimensional. I have a question, another kind of uh, more like overarching developmental question for you about rookie guard Osiris Torrance, because he was someone who was not definitively on the Giants radar in the pre-draft. Um, but he, we did have David Cyrus on uh, a scout who from our lads, who basically said, I view him as a top 15 overall prospect. And I'm mm -hmm. thinking now looking back, some fans are probably thinking of his name when they watch our weekly breakdowns, of the Giants interior offensive line. Yeah. And a lot of fans are thinking maybe we could be better with somebody like Torrance on the line. How's he transitioned to the NFL in your mind on tape? What is the tape telling you about him early on? He stood out. He has stood out last, the last game against the Jags. It was by far his worst game. Um, he had issues. I know it's something that you guys have had issues with at times, uh, stunts and twists, oh. uh, you at know, times you mean yeah. all the time, <laughs> um, him and Spencer Brown kicking out wide versus wide alignments. And then you're getting that DN spiking inside. They did it with Walker, Trayvon Walker. They did it with Josh Allen last week. And it got the quarterback, Josh Allen, off his spot. And then they were sending secondary rushers from, uh, you know, the, the secondary uh, to kind of bottle up Josh Allen, the quarterback. And so I will say that's probably the the, the biggest struggle he's had is, um, you know, the pass offs on those stunts and twists. It doesn't happen often. Last week was the worst week of it. If you go back and watch it, it was definitely the worst week of it. Um, but again, those, those ed rushers of uh, the Jags are really good as well. Um, and so overall I've been impressed with him. He's, he's got that anchor that the bills were looking for. The bills went and upgraded at both guard positions, getting Torrance, getting Connor McGovern, uh, a guy I'm sure you guys are familiar with because of their ability to anchor and hold the pocket and pass pro. They want these guys, especially the interior three, the center and guards to finish near the line of scrimmage so that the pocket doesn't get pushed into the face of their quarterback, Josh Allen. And so their, their tackles are on islands a lot. And that's why I talked about, you know, the chips and all that from the tight ends and, and nudge blocks from running backs earlier. And so that, you know, ability to anchor has been, it stood out for Torrance, his grip, his power in the past game is, is showing out. And then when you get him downhill on some of those combination blocks with Spencer Brown, who is again, a, a really good run blocker, you're getting that displacement with him because he's got that power and they work together so well. And um, I think right now he he's, he's on the trend upward. He had a, a rough game last game, but he's a consummate professional. He just keeps his head down and you don't see him ride the wave. If he has a bad rep, he, next rep, he's, he's on the ups and up. So uh, he's been a really good pick. Um, and one that I loved watching at the senior bowl. Like he's a guy you had to watch up in up close and personal and a lot of those drills at the senior bowl, which we were blessed to do. And, uh, and so I, some of the, the weaknesses that we saw even down there where he, he would get beat with speed to his edges. We're not seeing it all that often, but again, now you're working as a unit, not just one-on-ones down at the senior bowl. He's not making comments about the bills, fan base, flipping burgers and flipping hot dogs. Yeah, that was rough. 
You don't go at the fans. You don't go at the fans. Uh, not a great look. No. Uh, <laughs> to transition, Allen had this just crazy first and 10, 29-yard pass to Gabe Davis up the sideline with about 230 left in the game against Jacksonville. He rolled to the field side against a cover two defense, and the field flat defender gained ample depth. Yeah. Allen could have easily picked up like 12, 15 yards, slipped out of bounds, but he kept his eyes downfield and threw an absolute laser to Gabe Davis. Perfect positioning. Mm -hmm. How often does Allen keep his eyes downfield? Because again, he had the alley to run. Is that something that he does a lot? And if so, does it ever pose a problem when the pressure is applied? Yeah, that's a great question. And I mean, we could probably do an entire episode on that because the great thing about Allen is obviously he's got traits and traits give you options, right? And so when defenses like the Jags last week, you guys watch it, when they sent rushers in waves at different levels at different times, you know, there are times where the offensive line wasn't accounting for that secondary rusher. And so now that's on Josh Allen to kind of, you know, make him miss or make him lose. And so, yeah, he is going to drop his eyes at times, especially if he's got to, you know, climb the pocket, slide in the pocket and consistently move in and around the pocket because you're having guys rush from different ways. Another thing the Jags did is they would loop that D end inside, attack the spot in shotgun. So they would get him to want to, you know, flush out of the pocket. And then, so he's the low end rusher. What the other end was doing was he was working the high side rush and he would come around the back. Like a, we call it a fish hook rush where he's coming around the back. He's not trying to bend and flatten to the quarterback. What he's doing, he's just arcing around the back of the quarterback. So when that quarterback gets flush off the spot, that quarterback wants to go one direct direction to the other. He's right there to make a play and usually make a play on the ball. So that's the type of thing you have to do with Josh Allen. You have to, that D line and the rushers that they're sending at him, you got to work together. It's a team, it's a teamwork type of uh, pass rush with him because he's so elusive. He's so athletic. And when he gets outside the pocket, if he gets outside the pocket, he's one of the most dangerous quarterbacks in the league. And the thing is he may drop his eyes, but he can quickly reacquire his targets down the field. They're really good in the scramble drill mode. And then the arm strength, like he's got that natural arm strength where he can still hit guys anywhere on the field, as Dable said in his presser. And so he's he's tough to, to really nail down and keep in the pocket. And then when he does drop his eyes, he can quickly reacquire. And then even if that it's late in the play and those guys are 40 or 50 yards downfield, the play is still live. Yeah, I mean, it's just a joy watching Josh Allen from my perspective, Eric. I'll be honest with you. I feel like when I watched this game against the Jags, the only game of the season I saw on film so far, but I was just wowed at how many wow throws he makes. The one Nick brought up, I really just like some of the sim quote unquote simple stuff that I just don't see a lot from the Giants quarterback or even the quarterbacks with the Giants. He had a backside dig throw mm -hmm. to Gabe Davis where he manipulated the front side of the play with his eyes. That's something, you know, backside dig. Like, I don't, I don't know <laughs> if I've ever seen that with Daniel Jones in five years, if I'm being honest. And he also had the play Nick brought up. I thought there was another play. I'm trying to remember uh, where it was like a double, it was two vertical routes on the left side of the formation that put the safety into conflict. And he just, just drilled the ball into yeah. the open like hole. Like, it's like, wasn't even a hole. I don't even know what I would consider that oh, like, late in the game to Hardy. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. And I was like, I don't even know if like Daniel Jones physically is capable of this or right. most of the quarterbacks who play Daniel Jones this is not a knock on Daniel Jones. I'm not trying to do that. But my question for you is, mm -hmm. Are these types of throws common on Allen's tape? Like I saw a handful of them in one game, or is this just like a game where he did have a lot of these spectacular types of throws? Honestly, and, and again, the Bills lost that game, and I don't think Josh Allen played bad. I think, again, the Jags' defense had a beat on their protections and where the ball was going to go. Um, obviously, he didn't you know, turn it over. He didn't even take any sacks, really. And so it's a type of game with him is like um, – Playing within himself, he's doing a lot better this year, aside from that first week, right, against the Jets. And there are times where, yeah, he can – and you talk about those backside digs because usually that's your second, third, or maybe even fourth read. Right. Right? And that's and that's why it's such a big thing, and, and maybe the viewers didn't quite understand it. Like, hitting the backside dig, that is Davis's forte. Like, that's one of his best routes, and it's because, again, he's that third or fourth option a lot of times uh, in those plays. And so – yeah, he's uh I, I don't I don't when I look back at that game, I I've been so blessed to watch him play and cover him yeah. that some even just the mundane play action shots from under center from the left hash to the far sideline, like Ooh. that's normal for him. Now he did underthrow digs on that deep yes. 48 yard pass, but he also, you know, had to manipulate the pocket a little bit and he was waiting for the safeties who were playing split field coverages 
to kind of declare what they were doing. And again, by the time you figure that out, he's throwing it from like right around the five yard line to the 40, 45 yard line, again, 48 yards down the field. So uh, again, we're lucky as Bills fans to, to watch him play and make these plays. Does it always work? No, but he's again, he's, he's definitely earned the respect and all of the glow that comes with playing quarterback, not just from the Bills mafia, but across the league. I want to ask you a quick question about the three wide receiver sets behind Diggs and Davis. I'm just trying to figure out who is it? Is it Khalil Shakir? Is it Deontay Hardy? Or is it Trent Sherfield? Like what is the most effective 11 personnel package for the Bills offense? I think that's what they're still trying to figure out. And, yeah. and, and you know, when you talk about these sort of things and incorporating a guy like Hardy, that's new and, and a different skill set. Shakir again, played some last year, but he only had like targets in the teens. Um, and the Bills' offensive philosophy, it's really changed. You talked about them drafting Dalton Kincaid. They're really right now a 12 personnel team, a 12 personnel team. They're running 12 personnel. So one one running back, two tight ends, 38.2% of the time. That's first overall, according to true media. So they're right now, they've been base 12 personnel, which is brand new. I mean, under Dable, they were they were like 90% 11 personnel. And even last year, they're heavy 11 personnel. So Finding that third wide receiver option in 11 personnel is still a, a thing in the works, and it's going to take time in that regard. Even Sherfield, like you said, really good player, inside-out player, but not someone that I think is a true slot in this system. Um, I, I think Hardy eventually is going to take it and because he offers the most upside and impact, and he's been doing a lot of things, clearing th you know some routes out for some intermediate and short stuff helping Diggs and helping Davis eat in those areas. But he's got the speed. They use him on those gadget plays, the jet sweeps, screens, wide receiver screens. Man coverage, like he's he's so quick and so fast that he is a man coverage beater in himself. And he's got some really underrated route running. So I think eventually, maybe not this week, event, well, maybe this week it is that. It depends on those tight ends. But I think he's the guy that eventually kind of takes the throne when it comes to the slot position in the Bills offense. You guys have been desperately looking for that third wide receiver since Cole Beasley has left, yeah. and now he's chilling on our practice. My guy. It's my guy. I love Cole, man. I love him so much. Um, uh, he's another one of those guys that you know I've had a relationship with and talked with a bunch and uh, taught me a lot about that position, especially in the Bills offense. Well, that's awesome. I want to ask you a little bit about James Cook. He's a player who I had on, I think, 85 to 90% of my fantasy teams this year. <laughs> um, he's averaging 3.1 yards after contact, which is incredible. Every time I see him, he looks great, but he's not playing all that much for what I expected on the Bills. What, you know, there's been a rotation here. They've had Damian Harrison. They've had Latavius Murray in. Is this something that's frustrated fans? Is this something frustrated that frustrates you at all watching the team as far as your expectation of how to maximize this offense? And what is kind of the reason why he's not really featured much in the red zone and, and, and you know, losing snaps? You know, I, I don't have an issue with it thus far because I felt like they have managed the reps like perfectly, like perfectly. I like last week against the Jags again, it got, it got away from them. They just weren't running the ball at all because they were not able to sustain drives. But the first few weeks, they've really managed these guys roles really, really well. And especially on those like critical downs, whether it's third and short or it's third and long and they need, depending on what they want, they have running backs that can do it. Now cook's probably not getting as much burn on third down, especially if it's third and long. Because, again, they're either going to have to keep a tight end in or run him back to help the offensive line at times. And so his inconsistencies as a pass blocker, he knows who to pick up. He just doesn't have the physicality or anchor when that running back is screaming down into the A-gap and right at your quarterback. And so he's whiffed a few times uh, when it came to pass pro. And so I think that's why you see Murray uh, on those third down and longs because he's very good at you know identifying the will and the mic okay, I'm checking them. They're not coming. I can release. And when teams do blitz, then he understands, okay, I need to become that hot. And you saw it again. There was a really nice tackle by Tyson Campbell on third and long uh, last game. But the week before <clears throat> they found Murray, no problem for 22 yards. And he catches you off guard with his size and his athleticism still, even after all these years in the league. Yeah. He's one of those guys who's just never going to go away. He has Frank nope. Gore yeah. type quality. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I have a I have a quick question about something I saw on film against Miami. Josh Allen, it was a rushing touchdown using dart bash. We call it on on this uh 
on this podcast. Yeah. The Giants, the Giants have attempted this a couple times this season, not quite to the success of the Buffalo Bills. So I just wanted to ask you, how much does Ken Dorsey call these designed quarterback runs for Josh Allen? This year, it's unlike any other year. He doesn't call them often. Uh, it was, so listen to some of these numbers. I pulled this one because I, I wanted to, to get the, the numbers because uh, it's something that's you know come up a lot uh, when we're talking to Bills offense. So in 2020, designed runs for Josh Allen, he had 72. 2021, he had 70. 2022, 67. All offseason, the coaches, the players, all they were preaching was, we need to save Josh Allen. We need him healthy. We need to limit some of those. Uh, design runs. He's going to scramble. You can't stop that. You, you know, you're not going to limit that because that's what makes him special. This year, design runs so far, he has eight. Wow. Three of those are touchdowns. <laughs> so, uh, so they are, they're making a concerted effort. And it goes back to everything we talked about the interior offensive line that they upgraded. It goes to the three running backs that you just mentioned. They want to take some of that, that load off of his shoulders. They want, and those third and short situations, they don't want him and running, you know, QB draw, QB, uh, you know, toss and pin a pull with the quarterback. They want the running backs to take those hits and, and save Josh Allen to, to, you know, so we can use those plays in those break glass situations. And against Miami, that was one of those plays where, like, it's something Dable was so good at doing in the red zone is, hey, I know the exact moment when that defense is going to be in man coverage. So I'm going to take guys away from the point of attack on that play. You're talking about where the tackle wrapped inside. He James cook goes from right to left to Josh Allen. They run that mesh. And I don't even think this was actually a true read because Josh alerted to this. I think he was keeping it hundred percent on this play, but as James cook goes across the, the formation, he keeps the ball tackle wraps from left to right in the formation because the defense was in man coverage, the tight end to the play side ran off his guy. So that's taking one guy away from the point of attack. And then the guy that was the linebacker that was covering James Cook in man coverage ran across the formation, yep. gave the tackle the leverage. It's always about, especially in the red zone, when things happen quicker, it's always about either numbers game or leverage game. And that's what Dable was great at. And Dorsey, you know, kind of adopted that same exact play. It's something the Bills ran a bunch for several years. But this year, they're just waiting for specific moments. And I think as the year progresses and some of the games are heightened and some of those bigger games, in the playoffs, they're going to use it a lot more because right now it's actually hurting the Bills' offense. They're not having right. those design runs. And it's something I talked about last night in the film room. Those design runs by quarterbacks keep the defense honest, keep you with a plus one in the mm -hmm. blocking situation. And so they're not running that right now. So you go back and watch a Jags game. Anytime they're in shotgun, you know, one of the things they're doing with Josh Allen is when they're handing the ball off, whether it's on duo from shotgun, whether it's on draws, Josh Allen's like sprinting towards the sideline or boundary and you're like why is he doing that you know it doesn't make sense that's their like qb keeper you know like to try to draw a defender no one's paying attention to that and so mm -hmm. they're not they're not running those design runs with quarterbacks anymore and so they're not getting the respect they're not getting the plus one that they are right now which is why right now they're averaging like 3.9 yards per attempt on running back runs from shotgun but mm -hmm. when they go under center they're averaging 5.8 and that's you know top five in the league so Something to keep in mind going into this game. They're, they're definitely scaled back on those design runs. Uh, and they're just they're saving it for, you know, crucial moments in games. And, and I think down the road. I want to take it back to the beginning for a second, Eric. A lot of what we time we spend on this podcast is discussing the quarterback position, its importance to the Giants, and importance to NFL, how we're going to win football games, and how to evaluate the position. We get a ton of questions. Just yesterday, we were asked to provide the four traits, four or five traits we think are most important to the position. But I want to take it back to the beginning with Josh Allen, because I would say Josh Allen is probably the quarterback pro prospect I most got wrong in my evaluation since I started doing this by far. And I think in a lot of ways, Josh Allen changed the way I evaluate the position 100%. from a projection standpoint. Yes. So I want to ask you about how did he go from the quarterback that I watched and a lot of us watched at Wyoming, somebody who was honestly at times missing passes to the flat from purely clean pockets. Yes. yes. Right. Like, yeah, not this elite evaluator, not somebody who you would see manipulated defense with his eyes to the left, to the play side, and then throw a backside dig. Like you said, it's like a common stance. Right. Gabe Davis. Like how did it change so much? And what are some of the signs maybe that you saw throughout that process that fans like us can look to with, whether that be with Daniel Jones's continued development or if the Giants go in a different correction, a direction at quarterback, something they can signs maybe that they can, you know, 
you know, see and and feel and understand that can lead to, okay, this is a sign that says this quarterback is developing in the way we want him to. You know, it's, it's a great conversation because my first senior bowl was Josh Allen's year down there. And, and I remember sitting right behind the bills brass in the end zone when they were warming up, trying to throw backline passes, kind of high point passes in the back of the end zone. And uh, the Bills brass were sitting in like the third, fourth, and fifth rows. And I'm right there behind them, just seeing, you know, watching what they're watching. I remember Josh consistently missing, almost hitting the coaches and staff of the Bills in the, you know, the fourth row. And, you know, to see him struggle on things like that and accuracy against air to yeah. what he's doing now, as you said, man, he, Lamar Jackson, Baker May Mayfield, uh, Sam Darnold, that entire class changed how I evaluate quarterbacks and, and really all together. Because it's a different game now. And, you know, I always say with Josh, it was he was a traitsy player, right? He was a traitsy kid. And traits give you options. And that's what you need in the NFL. Because nowadays, you're not going to have a good offensive line for many games in a row consistently. There are going to be injuries. You're going to have to, you know, escape the pocket and make plays outside of script. Um, you so you, you got to have that athleticism and uh, be able to avoid and manipulate the pockets or, again, get outside of the pocket. Um, and with him... He was always an intelligence guy, intelligent guy. I think a very smart guy. And again, once Dayball kind of tapped into how he learned, that's when you saw that him kind of you know take his game to another level. And then again, the traits of be, having that arm strength. You're not always going to be in rhythm. Off, most offenses nowadays, they're not like the Kyle Shanahan West Coast hit the top of your drop type throws. He doesn't. The, Josh Allen, they don't ask him to do that. You know, a lot of the routes that they run are leverage routes. They're not, hey, get to this depth or on the seventh step, run this break. It's not that. It's actually, hey, when you get to this area where the cornerback is now squatting, that's when you run your corner. It's not, hey, get the seven yards, run your corner. Right. And you get past the corner, then run it. So they tailored the offense to Josh Allen and, and used all those traits that he's good at to and maximize those things. And so he's not he's not a guy that's still even at to this point where he's not always going to be on on top of his game when it comes to processing, but that's where arm strength does matter. And you talked about how yeah. that, you know, has changed your view of, of uh, evaluating quarterbacks, arm strength, Nick, when we went through the scouting Academy, we were always told like arm strength is like one of the lower tiers when it comes to priorities of a quarterback, because Absolutely. how can you overcome the lack of arm strength processing? I can right. see it and anticipate it. I don't need a big arm, you know, and, and not to, you know, not to be rude, but like to the Kirk cousins of the world. Right. And so yes. you, you don't need that arm strength. Now, nowadays, maybe you don't need to be a top tier processor, but if you have the athleticism to extend the play just a little bit and the arm strength now becomes a factor on you may be late to that process and process in this coverage, but you have the arm to make up for it late. Hmm. That's why it, he's changed the game and how we evaluate things because a lot of those traits that, you know, back, back then when he was coming out where the traditional evaluators really didn't put a lot of stock in. It's kind of flipped. Those those things are now being ranked near the top, the way right. the offenses are, and way that the college game, high school, college game have come into the NFL. I think that's an excellent great point. Yeah, yeah, great answer. Excellent point, Eric. And dude, the entire NFL evaluation, like there have been so many anomalies that have just struck gold in the NFL that evaluators are starting to look at the NFL game so differently. And that's why yeah. old heads haven't really adapted as much. And I think a lot of giant fans can um, understand the subtle shot that I am taking at a former giant general it, yeah. manager. <laughs> uh, maybe not so the subtle shot, but I want to, I know we're going to get you out of here soon. Thank you so much. Been so gracious with your time, Eric. But a hot name around Giants Twitter and in New York right now is Bobby Johnson, former Buffalo Bills offensive line coach, current Giants offensive line coach. Eric, what were your opinions of Bobby Johnson when he was the offensive line coach out there in Buffalo? So I've seen a clinic from Bobby Johnson. And so I will say what he teaches, I love. Uh, I talked earlier about offensive linemen finishing near the line of scrimmage and winning leverage and getting head up on uh, the pass rusher and, and again, getting down the cylinder, what they say, Hey, you know, get down the cylinder of that guy. Um, he that teaches all. Yeah, exactly. And so he teaches all those things. Now, obviously I'm not in the meeting rooms with them. Um, but there were some, you know, I will say the fan base didn't see the progress in development out of some of the players that the bills invested in. And he's also kind of that old guard that brings in guys and, you know, that have similar traits and guys that he's familiar with that they know what to expect 
you know, and, and he's going to carry out those, the, the, those offensive linemen will carry out those techniques. It's tough, man, because now with Aaron Cromer, it's, it's kind of night and day wow. where Aaron Cromer, he's, you know, with, with Bobby Johnson, he's got a certain set of rules and processes to whatever he's teaching. Right. And you kind of fall in into those buckets. Cromer takes each individual player and kind of curates whatever he wants them to execute because they're different players. You know, Mitch Morse came on our show and says, Hey, he's teaching me something different than he's teaching a six, eight right tackle, right. Or uh, a six, three guard. Like you can't teach the same processes and techniques to everyone across the line of scrimmage because everyone is built differently. And so I will say that's one thing that, you know, shows up on film shows up in some of the, again, the clinics between those two guys. Uh, I love watching clinics in off season and, and I've seen a bunch from those two. Um, I will say that's the biggest difference. And in the end, I, I think the development, we didn't quite see the development that uh, we wanted to when the bills did invest, which is kind of similar to what you guys, we, they did invest in guys that um, were you know, kind of held its traits that Bobby Johnson likes, Ooh. you know, long, tall, um, athletic, you know, really good RAS scores, kind of like a, a Brandon Bean thing, probably more so than Bobby Johnson, but, um, it's very Uzudu like when, when he was coming out, Bobby Johnson was there at his pro day, you know, with some of the other bills coaches, he loved him. And, and, uh, and so I just think that's where I see the differences between, but Aaron Cromer, again, we're lucky because he's probably one of the top five offensive line coaches. So no disrespect to Bobby Johnson. It's going to be tough to match that. But the development wasn't quite there, and the investment was from the organization, but they didn't see um, a lot of the development that they thought they would. Well, I will say this, and I'm not trying to knock the guy, but you could it's one thing to say development, and that is something that we're all seeing. But I think even when we discuss that, some fans are like, okay, but can you give me some kind of what's behind development? Like development's one big word, but and you kind of did that right there. Eric. I'm not saying I'm not trying to, you know, say what you're saying, but sure. When you talk about how one coach is teaching one thing to all of the offensive linemen. The other coach is curtailing it to each individual offensive lineman. It's hard for me to sit here as someone who doesn't know as much as you about the situation or in general doesn't know much. We Nick and I always talk about it. it's like when fans are killing Bobby Johnson, calling for his job, we're always like, eh, it's hard for us to get on board that because we don't really know the ins and outs of the day to day right. from offensive line coach. But when you talk about that, how you know you have it just leads me back to general football coaching. Like mm -hmm. what's better the off the coach, like Jason Garrett, who's trying to get Daniel Jones to fit his old system. Or is it the coach like Brian Dable who's curtailing a system around Daniel Jones's skill set? And mm -hmm. I don't know if that doesn't just apply down the line, like two offensive line coach, like maybe you should be applying different principles to a six foot seven player, like Evan Neal and an interior player, like John Michael Schmitz, yep. as you say, Aaron Cromer is doing. So it is something that gives me a little bit more, I guess of a focus on what I can look for and what, how I can maybe differentiate what different, the difference between offensive line coaches, the best, the best coaches are the best teachers. Exactly. It's just about to say that, Eric, I was just yeah. about to say it's more broad than just coaching. It's <laughs> teaching. Me, recovering the same cloth, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I love it, man. All right, Eric, we're going to, we're going to get you out here. Thank you so much again. Of course. But we want to see, and you don't have to do this if you don't want to, but we like to get score predictions at the end of mm. each of our shows with our guests. So the floor is yours if you'd like to do it. If not, no issue. I typically don't do projections, but for you guys, I will. I'd say <laughs> I'd say uh, Bills win 31 to 13. Okay. All right. So mine is – so I actually went on a cover one show with Greg and Aaron last yep. night, and they were shocked by my score prediction. And uh, it's not because I thought the Giants were going to do well. I said 31 to or 34 to six. And that's big. Yeah. I, uh, I'm hoping that the Giants, like you said, Brian Dable knows protection. Maybe he can get some sacks and rattle Josh Allen. But the Giants offense is so bad right now. And we don't even know who the quarterback is going to be. The offensive line, we're not even certain on who's playing what position. If Justin Pugh is getting called up from the practice squad. We're excited about that. Like the, the state <laughs> of the offense is so putrid he's gonna be I'm in his going bag to... dable and that offense they're gonna have to that is true things. yeah yes they're gonna do some things in prime time it's dables that's that's a staple when he was with the bills that he always in these games there's gonna be some kind of end reverse throw there's gonna be like a okay a, a double pass like he's gonna pull out all the stops sunday night i i feel that from dable 
I don't like that. I, I don't disagree with that, but I convinced myself in the previous three primetime games that that same exact thing was going <laughs> to happen, and it just hasn't. And the offense, man, every time they get in the scoring range, they just take the pistol out and they shoot themselves in the foot. And I'm like, oh, man, I just don't even – I'm just not sure. So I'm, I have 34 to 6. Dan, what about you, man? Yeah, I thought you were going to say when they take the pistol out, they shoot themselves uh, <laughs> by mistake in their in their in their in their thigh area, like an old black. Oh, oh that would have been a that good a full circle. That would have been it. You know, I thought you were going really. there with that, Nick. But <laughs> good look, job, man. Last week you did a great job predicting the score, Nick. I believe you said thirty-one to thirteen last week, if I'm not mistaken, against the Dolphins, and it was thirty-one sixteen. Was That's I wrong so, about yeah. that? I thought uh, no, no, it was, it was it was a close prediction. It was thirty-one ten or thirty-one thirteen. Might have had seventeen though. It was, it was around there. Okay. I had the Giants only scoring nine, I believe, or six in that game. This game, the Giants are 14 and a half point underdogs. They were 12 and a half point underdogs last week. Mm. I want to think what you said is true, Eric, but no Andrew Thomas in this game. Once again, no John Michael Schmitz. They're using a guard at center. They're using a guard at or a guard at left tackle. Tyrod Taylor, I think, is most likely playing in this game. What Saquon do we think about Barkley? Yeah, what, what's the deal with Barkley? I don't think Saquon's going to play. He, he looked Starting like he wasn't going like. to play, yeah. So now there's no Saquon Barkley. Aziz Ojolari, I don't think, is going to play, but maybe he will. If he's even on the field, that's another big one for them. So it just doesn't add up for me. The one thing I've been telling Nick, though, is like, will there be any jet lag feeling for the Bills in like London? It's yeah. like, we're digging for straws here. We're no, grasping for it's straws. It's true. I mean, they changed their practice schedule early this week to have a walkthrough and, and whatnot because of the travel back. And then again, now you're not going to a 1 p.m. game. It's a, right. you got to wait all day Sunday. Who knows? I don't know, but maybe that keeps them competitive for a little bit longer. But I am going to go with Bills 34, Giants 13. Okay. Yeah, yep. very similar. I like it. Yep. All right, Eric, thank you so much for joining us on this podcast. One more time, why don't you let people know where they can find your work? And I will say this, like you guys always tell us, get more X's and O's people on, get more X's and O's people on. We got you. The best one I've had on yet. And I'll be thank honest you. with you, Eric, I learned so much on this episode. And, I, and I've we've had great people on, so I'm not trying to knock those people. They've been almost as good as you. But I got to be honest, yeah, this was the you. best that we've had, in my personal opinion. By, this by has been fun. I love it. I love talking shop. Again, I could do this yeah. for another hour. Like It was a, yeah. a great time. And as I said, uh, you guys do great work. I respect everything you guys do. Um, and I, I actually am, you know, if, if I had a second team, it would be the Giants, again, okay. because of the players I have relationships with over there and some of the staff there yeah. um and i do think hey if there's any silver lining to a rough season this year this very it very much mimics year two of the bills regime after they made the playoffs the first year they backed yep. in because the Bengals helped them second year they started trading some people away and getting ready to draft a quarterback that's where there's a slight difference in how things are done but Again, Not that second year, the Bills, <laughs> the, the Bills were in this situation that you guys are in. So, you know, again, keep your heads up, keep grinding. I know you will. Um, you can find all my work at Cover One on uh, all social media platforms. Wednesday night, we do film room breakdowns like you guys do, uh, 7 p.m. on the Cover One YouTube channel. We have 14 podcasts, so any type of commentary, film stuff, X's and O's, um, hot takes type shows. Like we have a little bit of everything on the network. Um, and our website is cover1.football. Again, thanks guys for having me on.